time for this week in virology, episode number 250, recorded on September 12th, 2013. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Today we're coming to you from Denver, Colorado. We're at the 53rd ICAC, the Interscience Conference on Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy. And I have a special guest for this TWIV today. He is a professor of molecular, cellular, and developmental biology at the University of Colorado Boulder, Bob Garcia. Hi, Vincent. Welcome. Thank you. Been uh, an old friend, long time. Long time. Shouldn't say old friend, should say a friend for a long period of time. Yes, yes. I think I met you first at study section right. ages ago. Right. So we're going to talk, Bob is not at the meeting actually, but he's here. No, I snuck in. Yeah. He snuck in. He's here in Boulder. <laughs> and uh, when I knew that we were going to do a TWIV from ICAC, I decided we should get Bob here. And it was tough getting here today, wasn't it? Yeah, there was a little rain up there in Boulder, uh, six inches in 24 hours. So. And we have a picture of your backyard, <laughs> which uh, will come up in a minute here, showing, and you posted this on Facebook this morning. Yeah. So this looks like a lake. You have a lake in your backyard. Yeah, I, I've always wanted lakefront property, and, and so uh, this morning I had some. I think hopefully it'll go away soon. Though. Now, why do we have so much water? It's just hard rain? It's, it's hard rain, six inches, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's the floodplain, right? The, the 100-year floodplain. So does this happen often? No. No. Last week it was 90 degrees every day. <laughs> and here it's been, I think today it's, it's 18 centigrade. It's, it's not bad, but it's been raining all week here actually. Yeah, yeah. Not great weather. No. You know at TWIV in the beginning we always talk about the weather and this was probably one of the best weather reports we've ever had. <laughs> so it stopped raining now so you'll have no trouble getting back tonight. No, public transportation is great. Well I appreciate your making your way out here. Sure, sure. We're going to have a fun TWIV talking about the viruses that you love, the polyoma viruses. Yes. And which we have not talked a lot about on TWIV. I believe we had, so we had Pat Moore talk about Merkel cell. And then we did an interesting story about the raccoon polyoma. Oh virus, yeah, that's very interesting. Which we'll, maybe we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about polyomas. But before we do that, I want to find out where you came from, where, where you grew up and went to school and so forth. Tell us about that. So uh, <laughs> my career is a little non-linear. Um, I grew up in the Bay, Ar Bay Area, south of San Francisco. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, I went to Harvard College, sort of sight unseen. Um, and then I, I must admit, I, I uh, wanted to go to graduate school very desperately. But uh, back then was the Vietnam War. And we had this thing called the lottery. Mm. And so I applied to graduate schools and medical schools, and my lottery number was low, and so I went to medical school in San Francisco. And, uh, at UCSF? At UCSF. <clears throat> and I immediately tried to get acquainted with, you know, the scientists there. And so I was actually working in the laboratory of Gordon Tompkins on glucocorticoid receptors when, when I was in medical school. And uh, being a sort of a risk-adverse person, I, I, I decided at the end of medical school, even though I hadn't quite, I co-enrolled actually in the PhD program. They didn't have MD PhD programs right, back then. Right. You had to sort of get into medical school and then mm. get into graduate school. And uh, I decided I'd better do an internship just in case the science thing didn't really work out for me and I could always practice medicine. <laughs> so I went down to Stanford and did an internship and, and it, while I was doing my internship, Gordon tragically died. And so, uh, my PhD thesis was sort of up in the air. And so I completed my uh, residency at Stanford and then I was looking around for postdoctoral fellowships instead of finishing a PhD. And I did a year it, actually in the mid 70s working on nematodes at Stanford, uh, waiting for Bruce Alberts to move out from Princeton to UCSF. And then I went to work with Bruce at UCSF and this was the late 70s and we were working on this really funny topic called histone acetylation, mm. which was, Bruce was really prescient in this regard. And then I decided that, well, maybe this was going to work out, so I probably should find a job in a medical school. And to do that, I had to do a, a subspecialty fellowship. And so mm -hmm. um, I decided, I, was, I, I turned to pediatrics because 
because those people were like the friendliest people around. <laughs> <laughs> and so they were really nice. And so I really, and so, but then I decided that I better do a subspecialty in something that I could do research in anything. And so mm -hmm. oncology was obviously the thing that you could obviously do anything you wanted to. And the best pediatric oncology program at that time was in Boston Children's. So I went back to Boston Children's and, and that's when I became involved in polyomaviruses in Tom Benjamin's lab because Tom was actually working on histone acetylation mm -hmm. in, in polyomaviruses. And so I worked in Tom's lab. And <clears throat> I think it was very fortunate back then those programs really cultivated young faculty and they, they let you stay on after your fellowship to be a junior faculty person and, and get your own lab, even though you know, your startup money back then was like $10,000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was crazy. But uh, I was working on polyomaviruses coming in my own lab at the Dana-Farber Boston Children's. And uh, in, so I was in doing some crazy experiments in, in my own laboratory trying to find out what phosphorylated the major capsid protein of polyomavirus. And we were expression cloning this protein. And, there was another scientist up at Brandeis, Don Casper of Casper and Klug, and he was very interested in sort of crystallizing this protein. And so we gave Don this protein to crystallize. And, and while I was working on kinases, and Don called me up about a month later and he says, I have good news and bad news, Bob. He says, the bad news is the protein didn't crystallize. And the good news is it all self-assembled into virus-like particles <laughs> in the hanging drops. And so that observation, singular observation in the mid-80s changed my whole life. So I've been working on virus assembly ever since. And so, uh, so I stayed on at the Farber until the early 90s. And then, you know, I was still, I, at that time, I was still seeing patients. I was still attending in the hospital a month a year and working in the Jimmy Fund Clinic a day a week. And, and uh, but then I decided that it was, and they encouraged you to go out and spread the gospel of Boston mm -hmm. Children's out to other places. So there was a job in Denver at Denver Children's. And so I came out here to be head of the hematology oncology section. And so I was administrating and doing my science and, and seeing patients. And that lasted for almost 15 years. I was section chief for 10 years. And, and finally, I just, there was just too much. And I just wanted to go back to science. And so about five years ago, I went up to the Boulder campus. Tom Check was starting this new program up there called BioFrontiers, and he wanted people who could do translational medicine. And so mm -hmm. I went up there and joined his program. And now I just do science, and I teach virology, and I, mm. I give, you know, this week in virology is homework now, and, and, uh, and <laughs> I don't homework. see patients anymore, and it's so, but it's been a wonderful life. And I think it's, you know, it's a lesson to be learned for young people. I mean, I came out of medical school with no debts because, you know, I had scholarships and state mm -hmm. and I couldn't have done this with you know having the debts that kids have these days and so I had the life that I wanted to live even though I didn't have any money it was, I didn't have any debts and so mm -hmm. and the very culturing environment I think is very important it's for you it's interesting that you went back to the lab but don't see patients anymore yeah well 30 years of pediatric oncology yeah I can guess is yeah. uh, was a pretty wearing yeah. and the last sort of 10 were all bone marrow transplant years and so it was time, and I'm getting, you know, where I wanted to focus on other subjects in science. Yeah, we're going to talk about some of your work today, which uh, I've been reviewing. It's fabulous stuff. Have you, uh, when, when you moved to Boulder, were Peter Sarno and Carla Kierkegaard? No, uh, unfortunately. And, you know, uh, when I first came here, uh, Carla was in Boulder and Peter was in, at Denver. In Denver. Right. And uh, unfortunately, the the twain couldn't meet and the, you know, there was a turf war between the two campuses and they both ended up at this unfortunate place at Stanford. And so. <laughs> <laughs> Where they, they've done well and they <laughs> they've done very well. But um, the, the, we've had Peter on TWIV uh, and Carla as well. And they're both the coronavirologists. They work on the same viruses that I do, so I know them very well. So let's dive into uh, polyomaviruses. Before that, let me remind our listeners out there that if you're on Twitter and you want to ask a question, um, you can use the hashtag ICAC, I-C-A-A-C, and it will be picked up here and we can answer it. And the, the audience can also ask questions. There's a microphone here. I know you're brave enough to ask a question. 
<laughs> I, I know him because he was in our graduate program at Columbia. It's a small world. Can you believe that? It's a small audience, too. Yeah, it's a small <laughs> audience, too. But outside, the audience is big. Polyoma. Many tumors, is that what it means? Yes, many tumors, polyoma. It's one of the first viruses cultivated in tissue culture back in the 1950s. Uh, Bernice Eddy at, at the NIH was really, you know, mm -hmm. there was a couple of very famous women virologists back then who were working on polyoma virus. And when you inject this virus into newborn mice, that was mm -hmm. critical, newborn mice, they uh, developed tumors in multiple different tissues, and so it was called okay. polyoma. But the virus she worked on was a mouse or a, or a simian virus? This was a mouse virus. The simian okay. virus, SV40, was discovered after the mouse virus during the polio vaccine production when mm -hmm. this vacuolating agent turned up in the production scheme, and, and it turned out to be a simian version of polyoma. Right. So the murine polyomas were discovered first, and they were isolated from wild mice or laboratory. They were isolated, uh, yes, from Ludwig Gross isolated them from tumors in, in, in mice, yes. Okay. And then Maurice Hilleman picked up SV40, which th had made its way into the polio vaccine, Right, right. A hundred right. million people were immunized with that. Was that the inactivated, both, or both? Both, uh, both actually, yes. So the question is, did it hurt any of those people. So that was a, a, a chapter in my life which I look back on, actually, and uh, <laughs> because uh, I had a postdoctoral fellow in the late 80s who, uh, there was a report that uh, the second transgenic mouse ever made was, uh, um, the first transgenic mouse was the human growth hormone mm -hmm. mouse, which was a fat mouse, a big mouse. And, and the second one was the SV40 large T antigen, the large tumor antigen protein. Mm -hmm. Under, the, under, its own, under its own promoter. And when they put that in a mouse, the mouse got these special tumors, these choroid plexus tumors of the brain. So when I was at, uh, still in Boston, the question was, well, maybe choroid plexus tumors in humans mm -hmm. might be caused by one of these human polyoma viruses. And so uh, one of the fellows in the lab went to look by this recently developed technique called polymerase chain reaction uh, for this uh, viral sequences in these tumors. And Quite unexpectedly, he found something that looked more like SV40 than mm -hmm. the known human viruses BK and JC. And so that started a chapter which ran quite a long time, and it's still going in some laboratories, of whether SV40 was in the human population causing a subset of these tumors. And it was, you know, some labs came up with positive results, and some labs mm -hmm. came up with negative results. And, um, Usually the Italians were positive and the other people <laughs> were negative. But, uh, but uh, the final, I think the crushing blow here for, for whether it was really a pathogen was, you know, we kept giving our samples to other people. And, you know, I think Janet Butel in Texas was sort of an advocate of this. And Miguel Carboni, who's now in Hawaii, is an advocate. But the real question came down to, well, is there seropositivity for this mm -hmm. virus in the human population? And so, because we were really wanted to settle this issue, and we felt that we had sort of stepped into this and started this debate, we did a very large serological screen of 2,500 normal blood donors from Denver mm -hmm. looking for serology for SV40, and it was basically below the limits of detection, basically below 2% of them. And this was an assay that would specifically detect SV40, SV40 capsid protein. VP1, right? Right. And so, mm -hmm. That sort of lended credence to the fact that although this, you know, it probably wasn't in the human population and, and probably wasn't causing tumors, although there's still a, a low rumble, I think that that sort of put the lid on, mm. on, on, on. And other people came up with that. Denise Galloway came up with that too. And uh, I think that uh, right now that that whole, that whole story settled down quite And good. we don't put SV40 in our vaccines any longer. So we don't give it to people. So eventually everyone who received it will no longer be around, right? Right. Because it's 1950s, so presumably some are still living, right? Right. Right. And there is an enormous number of people got it, especially yeah. in the Soviet Union, which the, they continue to give uh, contaminated vaccines much longer than we did. Well, I, got, I got my first inactivated Salk vaccine in 55-ish. Uh, yeah. And then I got, again, the... Sabin vaccine in 62. So the, the first lots of Sabin vaccine also had SV40 right. in them That's as correct. well. That's correct. 
so uh, I'm as far as I know sort of fine. fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine as far as I know. Now the other thing that uh, SV40 is famous for is uh, amazing molecular biology. SV40 yeah. and murine polyomas, right? I mean, I went through my virology education hearing about T antigen, right, and uh, transformation and DNA replication, right. Could we just briefly? Review yeah. the contributions. Yeah, it's a really a model system. This virus, uh, when it came, when it was discovered, and, and and I think the real impetus was that, and the real funding came from the fact that, um, you know, it did cause tumors and mm -hmm. rodents, and so there was a very, the way I describe it now to my virology students is that there was this real peak in DNA tumor virology in the, in the late '60s and all throughout the '70s. Tumor mm -hmm. viruses were the thing to study in virology. And therefore, a lot of efforts were put on describing the functions of T antigen, the tumor antigen, which seemed to be the transforming gene of SV40. And, and polyoma, mouse polyoma, had this other gene called middle T antigen, which was sort of a membrane-bound protein. And, and then at the late 1970s, early 80s, you know, there was this other co-precipitating protein with T antigen, which was found out to be P53. And then it was found out that, oh, by the way, T antigen bound the retinoblastoma protein. And, and oh, by the way, this promoter was really an enhancer element. And, and oh, by the way, there's splicing. And so it went on with adenovirus. And so there was a very rich history of this virus contributing mm. a lot to cell biology. As a matter of fact, being a member of the DNA virus, you know, community at that time, at least as a student and early faculty member, we were sort of, I, I hate to say this, but we had the DNA tumor virus meeting every other year at Cold Spring Harbor. But after all of these, you know, recessive oncogenes and things came up, and, and then of course there was cellular oncogenes, sort of blew tumor viruses out of the water, you know, when Bishop and Varmus really showed that SARC was really C-SARC. Right. These are the ones identified using RNA tumor viruses. Right, right, right. That tumor viruses really went on the decline and cellular oncogenes came up. And, and after a few years, you know, we even got kicked out of Cold Spring Harbor because mm. now they were having home meetings on recessive oncogenes and P53 instead of our viruses. And so there was a big change there, I think. Uh, but there, a lot was learned from SV40 and, and is still being learned. It's one of the... <clears throat> best systems for studying eukaryotic DNA replication. Right. I mean, Bruce Stillman, Cold Spring Harbor has basically recapitulated the whole system in, in vitro. And Ellen Fanning, Fanning, who just passed away, actually, That's right. contributed really significant to this whole field. And so we learned a lot about PCNA and all of these things. Yeah, I, I teach this in my virology course. So for the first time in my career, I truly understand it. And I'm amazed. SV40 is a small circular DNA genome, double-stranded DNA, not too big. 5,200 base pairs. 5,200, almost the same as the height of Denver, right? <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, it has a single origin of replication, which is where the DNA replication starts. And because we had one in a small DNA that we could purify, it allowed us to set up in vitro systems, right? Right. And, and then eventually identify origins in in uh, other systems like eukaryotic cells, right? Really amazing. But I think the the real, the real, you know, plus minus here was that we thought, ah, oh, here's a simple genome. We're going to figure out everything, and it turns out that this protein T antigen is not so simple. It, amazing. It, it's it's amazing. amazing protein. <laughs> it binds everything, and so really, you know, uh, there's a trade-off. You can study the large viruses, which have a gene product that just does one thing. Right, you know, for everything, but this gene product does a hundred right. things, and that's because it has a small genome, so it has to maximize the right. capacity. So, if you look at a map of T antigen protein, they have so many domains that do different things in DNA replication, transcriptional activation, um, interacting with many proteins, transformation. Of course, the transformation is is a byproduct. This, the virus doesn't want to transform cells. A absolutely. Right? Absolutely. It wants to kick the cells into dividing so that it can use its DNA replication machinery. Absolutely. And actually, it's just coming out now that really what these, what these polyomaviruses really want to do is to actually keep the cells in S phase right. because then they can replicate their genomes. So they have an, an SG2 block that they basically impose on the cells. So can we go briefly through the 
a, a, a typical replication cycle, starting with receptor binding and uptake and, and getting in the nucleus. So what are the receptors for polyomaviruses? So this is really a hot topic that's really quite debated. Um, I think <clears throat> I think we've come appreciated that most viruses don't have one receptor. Maybe polio. Oh, I was going to say Diff polio does. Polio is a little <laughs> bit different, but uh, these viruses don't, mm -hmm. and I think papilloma they don't either. Um, all of the polyoma viruses at least initially bind some kind of sialic acid, mm -hmm. either a glycan or a glycoprotein, for JC virus binds a glycoprotein, on the cell surface. But this interaction is really a very low affinity interaction. I mean, mm -hmm. each interaction is about millimolar. You can get avidity because you get multiple binding sizes. Right. But then, then the concept now is, is that the virus then gets passed off to perhaps a, a, another receptor perhaps for polyoma, we think maybe an integrin, and then perhaps gets endocytosed. And there, the field was clear for a while and is now totally up in the air again because mm -hmm. uh, receptor-mediated endocytosis for these viruses had appeared to go through these structures called coveolae, mm -hmm. which Ari Helanius had defined, but which really it looks like these viruses can go through a number of different endocytic pathways, not just coviolae. What, what seems to be, and so that's a really an area that's still up in the air, that's still, and it's probably going to be not a definitive pathway. And maybe what these viruses do is that they, they do one of these sort of storm the castle kind of things. So they, mm -hmm. they throw 100 particles on the cell and one gets in, right. you know, kind right. of kind of scenario. It's really not sophisticated, but it works. And, and, but what, what it does seem to happen is that somehow uh, the end organelle at these end find themselves in as the endoplasmic reticulum. And so whatever endocytic pathway is, they end up in the endos endoplasmic mm -hmm. reticulum. But then the problem is these are non-envelope viruses. These are protein. So how do you get your genome through that endoplasmic membrane out into the cytosol and then into the nucleus? And that's another, uh, we've been studying these viruses, what, 40, 50 years, and we still don't know how that happens. There's a lot of theories about how it happens, and, and I think we're getting closer. We don't actually work on that, but that's a very interesting topic. It seems convoluted to go to the ER and then back out in the cytoplasm and then in the nucleus. But that's our view, the human view, right? That's the human view, right. So the DNA has to get in the nucleus, right? That's has the to final... Get. Because they are, the first thing that happens is some mRNAs are made, right? Right. So, you know, the early gene, gene transcription occurs, and you get T antigen being made. But it can, the genome can be transcribed without any viral gene product, right, initially? Right. right. Okay. And then when you make T antigen, then you can do even better right. mRNA synthesis. Right. And, of course, another thing that was discovered with these viruses, of course, is this nuclear transport signals, of course. That's right, nuclear localization so they, signals. So right. for T antigen, you know, it, it's, it, it gets imported back into the nucleus, and that's where NLSs were first discovered. That's right, the SV40 NLS, right? right. And then the virus replicates its DNA in the nucleus, and as we will see, it assembles in the nucleus. Right, like a lot of DNA viruses. In fact, probably the majority of DNA viruses assemble themselves in the nucleus. Yeah. And so... You know what one exception is? Uh, Thick, rich condit. Pox, yeah. well, well, pox viruses are, are like... Uh, there's a couple of other exceptions which are, I'm blocking on, but pox viruses make their own nucleus in the cytoplasm. That's right. So that's sort that's of right. cheating almost. Uh, the Mimi viruses also seem... These big, giant DNA viruses also seem to set up their own shop in yeah. the cytoplasm. They make their own nucleus. That's a good way to look at yeah, it. I never thought about nucleus. it that before. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. So we're going to go over one of your, your recent uh, papers and look at the uh, replication and assembly in the cytoplasm, uh, in the nucleus. But then how do they get out and into the extracellular? Do they, do they trash the cell? Basically? So, so, yeah. So in the olden days, basically, we'd say, oh, it lyses the cell. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And you just throw your hands up in the air, and the viruses just explode the cell. And to a certain extent, that's true. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at an infected cell, late in infection, I mean, it's basically a crystalline array of virions, at least in tissue culture. But, you know, in vivo, what happens, you know, there's some evidence from some sources that there may actually be a basal lateral, you know, 
excretion of SV40. Oh, right. I think right. Dick Compan showed Dick that Dick Compan showed right. that up many yeah. years ago. And that's extremely interesting. It makes a lot of sense because, you know, a lot of our human viruses hang out in our proximal renal tubule cells. And they're not there destroying them. They're probably just getting pumped out yeah, on okay. occasion into your re or something. Okay. So that's a good segue. Let's talk about human oh. polyomaviruses. Okay. Um, when was the first one discovered? So 1971, um, two were discovered. One was called JC virus, and the other one was called BK virus. They were both named after the patient's initials. From right. what they were. I thought it was Burger King. Burger King. No, not Burger King. No. Oh. And the other one, you could guess. James Cunningham. But, so those uh, are patient names, JC and BK. Okay. okay. How, they were isolated from patient from material? To, from patient material. So um, JC virus causes this very unusual disease um, called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. It's a rare disease of the brain where you get destruction of oligodendrocytes. And it's where mm -hmm. the JC virus has destroyed those. And so in, in evaluating these disease, that disease, polyoma particles, as described by electron microscopy, and of course we had polyoma in, discovered in the 50s, and so you know what they look like were discovered in these tissues. And the same thing for a renal transplant or a renal uh, patient for BK. Uh, these viruses were discovered in the urine. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and so they were there, just there, and, and it was an amazing sort of epidemiological studies then that it turned out that when they tried to do seroepidemiology on these viruses, it looked like a lot of, a majority of people were actually infected with these viruses, but very few were actually symptomatic with these viruses. And when they looked carefully, it looked like, well, even maybe 10, 5 to 10 percent of people were actually excreting these viruses in their urine every day. What kind, well, how many viruses, what kinds of amounts are we talking so about? So it depends. It depends on normal, you know, uh, I would say 100,000 per mil in a normal person particles. But if you're immunosuppressed, it can be in the hundreds of millions. 100,000 per mil is Pretty not good. Easy. another reason to stay away from toilet seats. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yesterday we heard about E. coli tra traveling on toilet seats, and now we have BK. Well, yeah, well, hopefully you put the seat up. But anyway, uh, so uh, this is presumably how they're transmitted. <laughs> well, yes, it's it's actually all it's all it's very much like the mouse polyoma virus. It's all transmitted from urine, mm -hmm. fecal oral, urine oral. They they ingest it or whatever. And the JC as well. JC as well. So where does that reside in? So this is a, this is another uh, both of the even though we've <laughs> again studied these since the early seventies. It's, it's pretty convincing that BK is in your proximal renal tubule cells, much right. like SV40. In monkeys. That, in monkeys, monkeys right. That's where Which it is why they got it in polio vaccine, because they grew it in monkey kidneys. Right, right. exactly. Which they cultured, right. yeah. And, and if you look at SIV-infected monkeys who get SV40, you can see it very strongly in their kidneys by in situ. But, um, but it was a real debate about where JC was, and it mm -hmm. looks like it's also primarily in the kidney as well. Right. And is it also excreted? It, it's definitely excreted in the urine, probably even more than BK. So what percent of the population did you say, 50%-ish? So I think you've done sero. Yeah, we've right? done a, a sero, serology studies. In the, in the old textbooks, and I don't want to cast aspersions, but the old, you know, when you study 40 patients, you get these curves where, you know, 80 or 90% of people are seropositive mm -hmm. with JC or BK. When you do 2,000 patients or whatever, you find that, yeah, 80 or 90 percent of people, normal people, are seropositive for BK, but only about 50 percent are positive for JC. Okay. And that turns out to be clinically very important these days because, um, as we could talk about, I mean, really these are sort of benign passengers for all of us. And it's only when you get immunosuppressed or get really old that polyomaviruses really cause a problem. And now that we have all these really interesting new immunosuppressive monoclonal antibodies, for example, mm -hmm. um, one of the side effects... HIV. HIV, yes. HIV was a big deal for, until we got heart therapy. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, JC, uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, was about 
5 to 7% of all encephalopathies in HIV patients. Mm -hmm. That has sort of gone a little bit lower now, but now with these new agents, it's come back and seen mm -hmm. in a number of patients. And, and because these drugs are blockbuster drugs, to have a side effect of a brain infection is really devastating. And so people have become much more interested in JC. They've developed much more sophisticated serology assays. So, mm -hmm. for example, one of the most successful treatments for multiple sclerosis these days is a, is a monoclonal antibody called Tisabri, which blocks lymphocyte trafficking in the CSF. And uh, 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 some fraction of those patients get PML. But if you're JC virus seronegative, your risk is really low. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's become a risk stratification technique now. And so these people have now have looked for the serology and other correlations of these viruses for risk stratification. So if you have MS, do you get typed for JC before you get a treatment? Well, hopefully that's the future. Yeah, we don't do that now. You should, if you're gonna get to Sabri. And if you are JC positive, you shouldn't get to Sabri. No, You get no. something else. No, well, I mean, for the mo so I, I can't be an advertisement here for these, these drugs because MS is obviously, a, a, you know, comes in different forms. Yeah. And it's treated differently around the country as well. And, and there's different immunosuppressive agents. And some people like to progress through some immunosuppressive regimen to another to another. Um, and to Sabri may be the third line or the mm -hmm. first line, depending upon where you are. But if you're risk stratifying and you want to give somebody to Sabri, if you're seronegative, the risk is one in 50,000. If you're seropositive, the one is, risk is one in 500. Mm. And, the, and therefore, like in all medicine, it's a risk-benefit analysis that you have to explain to the patient. Right. It's not that you right. shouldn't give them the drug. So do, how about transplant recipients? I would imagine they would get immunosuppressed and you could activate these two viruses as well. Does that happen? So it happens, but it happens more often with BK. Okay. And it's very, actually in bone marrow transplants, which I've had some experience with, rare if ever do you see JC, much less than these other It's new interesting, models. right? It's very interesting, and it's uh, which cells do you hit? And yeah. you, know, you're, you know, with the Sabri, you're hitting trafficking into the CSS, because that's what the therapy is, where the other ones are sort of a broad spectrum immunosuppressive. Right. And so BK can be a very, very bad side effect in about 5% of, of transplant patients where they get mm -hmm. very bad hematuria, you know, and uh, cystitis. And it's really a very serious problem because you're making so much virus that you're really causing hemorrhaging in the right, kidneys right. and the bladder. And do we, again, do we type uh, transplant patients for it? No, we don't. BK virus. <laughs> so this is another, this is a very interesting topic that's come up and I think it's really being pioneered by Chris Buck at the NCI. And, and so uh, another aspect of this is actually kidney transplants per se. Uh -huh. Because you're, a certain number of kidney transplants are rejected because of reactivation of BK. And the question is, what Chris has found is that there's not just one type of BK, there may be four types of BK. Mm -hmm. And that if you're seronegative or maybe have neutralizing antibodies to three and you get a kidney with the other type, you may not do so well. And right. so this, I think, could be a, a, something that could be coming down the road future in clinical medicine for renal transplants is actually typing for BK virus and typing the donor recipient and then determining risk. You know, I, we, I have heard a number of talks here at this meeting where the the issue of the cost of medical care keeps coming up and trying to do the least number of assays on your patients. So yesterday we talked with someone who treats people with urinary tract infections and he said, you know, you would like to type to make sure you don't have resistant bacteria, but we just give them antibiotics. And it sounds like adding more clinical tests is not going to go very well. Well, so I agree in that respect with that particular scenario. But when you're dealing with renal transplants and perhaps bone marrow transplants, yeah. it's a very select number of patients. So you, if you're doing a specific test, it may not, the cost benefit may be higher than if you were doing a whole population. Right. 
So uh, you, you may have answered this already, but one of the questions I had is how can these viruses be resident in your kidney? Presumably they're replicating in, in many of us, right? Or are they not replicating? And why don't they kill cells? We don't know any of the answers, right? You, we don't know any of the <laughs> answers. Those are all excellent questions. And uh, I think one of the answers is that because, of, you know, fraction and perhaps all of us at one time or another will excrete these viruses. And if we're immunosuppressed, we'll definitely excrete these viruses mm -hmm. at a higher rate. Maybe if you get stressed, you, immunos you secrete them. Absolutely. And, and, and certainly, actually, it's been well known during pregnancy mm -hmm. that pregnant women excrete these viruses much more right. during that time. And so um, my conclusion, and because your kidneys seem to function perfectly normally most of the mm -hmm. time, you're not doing a, a, a destructive lesion. So maybe Dick Compans's observation that you can actually right. put these viruses out without destroying cells is, is maybe a real physiological uh, mechanism. I think there's no doubt that 80 to 90 percent of the population are infected with BK, 50 mm percent -hmm. with JC, and and I think <clears throat> it's the way we are with a lot of viruses. We've come to have a persistent. Well, it's the it's the words I say to my virology students now is, DNA viruses are the gift that keeps on giving, right? <laughs> so it doesn't make any difference which DNA virus you get, CMV, herpes, you know, varicella. They're always with you. They're just sort of hiding out someplace. Yeah. If you get immunosuppressed or have some other stimulus, they may be replicating and they may cause a problem. But otherwise, we coexist with these. The question that really crosses my mind now is that, so we've come to some kind of evolutionary equilibrium with these, gut, these agents. And there must be some kind of benefit, maybe, that they're yeah. actually providing us. I was going to ask you what the benefit is. And, I, you know, <laughs> um, it's an excellent, uh, you know, question, and I don't know. And I think it's very difficult to say for all of these viruses what mm -hmm. they're providing. But I think the very fact that we've come to coexist with them yeah. is, 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 is probably telling us something. So you could do an experiment and get rid of them all and see what happens from, from us. So we have like a dozen or so viruses in each of us, and yeah. we could make a broad spectrum antivirus. In fact, a student uh, suggested this in, in my class because I was talking about broad spectrum antivirals, and the student came down afterwards and said, wouldn't that be a way to find out if these viruses are beneficial or not? So I wish, first of all, I wish we had a good antiviral. Right, we don't have. We don't have them. Uh, the ones that we have really don't work. Um, they're really sledgehammer kind of approaches. Do we have anything against JC and BK? Well, you know, there's this drug called Sadofovir, which I, you know, I don't believe in whatsoever. Okay. I've given it, and it, it's a broad spectrum DNA synthesis inhibitor. It really doesn't affect the outcomes. So really, we have nothing. Mm -hmm. I would say we have nothing. What we treat, you know, for the immunosuppressed patients is we actually withdraw immunosuppression. Mm -hmm. So you have to titer it back yeah. until they get enough immunological reserves that they can actually fight off the viruses. But we have, and, and so this is a very big deal now, I think, especially with JC, because these are blockbuster drugs out there. You know, these are billion, two billion dollar drugs with these, you know, immunological agents for psoriasis and, mm -hmm. you know, arthritis and MS. And if you had a good antiviral small molecule inhibitor, you could treat these people who get the side effects and you would lower the risk dramatically. Sure. So I think that there's a real opportunity here for people out there to, to really design, and I hate to say this, you know, screens for these kind of things. Uh, how you would do it is really up in the air. It's so no, no one is doing that as far as you know? A lot of people are probably doing it and yeah. I don't know. And uh, <laughs> you can grow these viruses in culture, I presume. Yes, some better than others. JC and BK can be... They're probably, difficult. They're yeah. very difficult. Uh, and, you know, and Mike Imperiali has got a great system with proximal renal tubule, you know, primary cultures. Mm -hmm. and, and, but uh, JC, you can grow in some cells, but they really like to grow in sort of, you know, neuronal cells that are kind of hard to grow in tissue yeah. culture. Um, what would be a good target for, des for uh, <clears throat> designing a drug that would inhibit? T antigen wouldn't be, I presume. Well, T-antigen might be, Maybe. might be, and that might be your student's drug. 
Because if, if you could mm. get one for one T antigen, it'd probably work on all the T antigens. Right. Another drug might be, you know, we haven't thought about this too much, um, but some drug that might interfere with the uh, subunits of the virus coming together. Since mm -hmm. we know the atomic structures of these viruses for the most part, we could design small molecules that might interfere with their sort of self-assembly capabilities. Yeah, it'd be tough, I bet. Very tough, but yeah. the assays are very good. Mm -hmm. So you could screen a lot of small molecules that way. And of course, most small molecules end up being toxic anyway, so <laughs> it's not such a great idea. It seems to me, from my naive viewpoint, that this is a, a, quite a medical need. I think it is a medical need, and uh, of course there's no money for it, but, um, but it would be a... Because the number of immunosuppressed individuals is only going to increase. Absolutely. Because right? we're getting better at it and Well, the other, so you know, the other part of immunosuppression that perhaps we don't want to admit to is getting older. You know, and I admit to it. Okay, but we're getting more and more immunosuppressed, and you know that's the Merkel story, of course, and a lot of other. You know, these viruses are going to rear their heads when we get older. And that's another good segue. Do you do this all the time, the radio shows? <laughs> <laughs> the other human polyoma viruses, besides BK yeah. and JC, yeah. you just mentioned Merkel. Right, which you talked about previously. Right, with Pat Moore, which causes a rare form of skin cancer, is that correct? It's not skin cancer, actually. Merkel cells are sort of very funny, sort of, uh, I, don't I don't think anybody knows exactly what they are, but they're sort of involved in sort of neural uh, function in your skin and your hair follicles, perhaps. They're not, ex mm -hmm. they're not certainly not skin cells per se. Okay. They're a specialized cell. But they're located in the skin. They're right? locally is in the skin. And, and these tumors, these Merkel cell carcinomas occur in older folks in, in the skin and they're very difficult to take care of. And as Pat has probably has mentioned, uh, you know, this is a real, this is a real boon to, you know, when we're down in the dumps in polyoma tumor virology, now we have a real human tumor virus that integrates into the genome mm -hmm. of the, every cell tumor cell and makes T antigen and that's the oncoprotein. The, the sort of the, the other news is that of course there's only a couple of hundred patients a year of this and so it's a very rare cancer. What does the sero surveys of Merkel tell us? Everybody's got it. Everyone? 90%. Okay. And Merkel, uh, BKJC, we all get early in our lives? So this is very interesting. So, we've, so BK we certainly get probably before we're five. From urine contamination. Urine and, you know, playing with our friends and okay. everything. JC apparently has got a much more slower on the uptake. It's probably by the time you're a teenager that you mm -hmm. probably become. And you graduate, and for both of these, you accumulate more seropositivity over the time. And in, in, in another segue, I mean, there's now and nine Mer new. But Merkel, before you do that, what Merkel is goes up right away, too. Okay. Looks like it goes up. We, you know, the epi seroepidemiology studies are, are, you know, now flourishing for these viruses. Mm -hmm. And so we'll, we'll be able to define, and, and it differs in different population groups, of course. Denver may be different than Germany sure, or whatever. Sure. Um, and we'll be able to have more age group discrimination as we get more patients. So tell us about the other human polyomas. And by the way, we did one of your papers a while ago a sero survey paper, one of the earlier ones on some of these human polyoma viruses. Um, so what are the others? So we have BKJC and Merkel. You said nine more? Yes. So this is like reciting the alphabet here. Um, I figured you'd know them all. Yeah, well, I sort of do. <laughs> I had to refresh my memory. But, um, <laughs> so before Merkel, there was uh, KI, Karolinska Institute, where it was isolated. I that was where it was okay. isolated. And WU, Washington University. So we call these the Wookie viruses. Wookie, that's right. Wookies. That's a good name for this show, isn't it? <laughs> and these are sort of uh, come from uh, uh, alveolar lavages or, or nasopharyngeal aspirates. They appear to okay. be in the upper respiratory system. Were these from sick people or healthy people? A little bit of both, actually. Okay. But I think in the beginning they were looking more at sick people. But we have we we actually and a lot of people now have looked in, in it for actually what what clinical syndromes these viruses by themselves might cause, mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to tease out. 
we did in, for the Denver patients here in the bone marrow transplant program, we, we had all the patients who had very severe pneumonias. And, mm -hmm. and, and the problem is you can isolate those, those viruses from those alveolar lavages, but you get 10 other viruses as well. And yeah, which yeah. one is the culprit here? And which one is the passenger? And I don't think any clinical syndrome has really been ascribed to Wookiees yet. And they're resident in our lungs, you say? They're, we're all seropositive. We're seropositive. But the, not kidney, what, not kidney replication. Uh, we don't size. know. Mm. We don't know very well. We don't know too much about those. Uh, so those are basically, so BK, JC, Wookiee for Merkel 5. Chris Buck at the NCI again uh, isolated two viruses, which we call human polyomavirus 6 and 7, uh, from skin. Mm -hmm. And this was basically... So the, the way they isolate these viruses is very interesting. I mean, there's a number of different techniques that they've used. Some is basically just deep sequencing whatever you get off the skin. Uh, Moore, uh, Pat Moore, of course, did this sort of digital transcriptome uh, uh, subtraction where he made cDNAs, took out all the human cDNAs and blasted what he had left right. and found Merkel. There's this other technology where a lot of people are using where they take some precious bodily fluid like stool and, and, <laughs> and treat it with proteases or whatever and, and basically get protected genomes. Right. And then sort of take off the coat and then do this, use a, 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 a phage, highly processive polymerase that will basically do rolling circle amplification. And you can get very long amplification of circular mm -hmm. protected genomes. Uh, and that's the way a lot of these other viruses were isolated. And so uh, Chris did, I think, uh, a little bit of both. And so both of those viruses are very interesting um, in that uh, uh, they don't seem to have sialic acid re receptors. They may have the gl glycosaminoglycan receptors that mm. papillomaviruses have maybe for the skin. And so they may be kind of some kind of hybrid in that regard for entry. And of course, the other problem with the skin, pap the skin viruses and a lot of these other viruses is, are these really human viruses or are these just passengers on your skin? So a lot of people are now working either with serology or whatever to figure out whether you've got seropositive or certainly if it's circulating in your blood, you know it's a human virus or if it's coming out in your urine. But if it's just on your skin, it's a little bit right. up in the air. Um, number eight was a, and I get this always wrong, it's from this other trichospinosis virus. I, 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 what is that? It's from another skin disease that okay. occurs in transplant patients where you get these spicules in the skin and you can see these polyomavirus particles and that's where they isolated that from. Uh, I, I'm sorry for mispronouncing it. It's not a problem with me. Okay. <laughs> Number nine is actually the virus that we were chasing for a long time mm -hmm. and didn't get. Um, and that is the human version of the primate lymphotrophic polyomavirus. And so um, in 1980, uh, Harold Zurhausen and Lutz Giesemann isolated from primate lymph nodes a virus, a polyomavirus, that would grow in both human B and T cells. It was a very interesting virus, but it was a primate virus, and we were really interested because of the, it looked like it was going to be a common theme that these viruses were going to be found in immunosuppressed people, that maybe, or in older people, that maybe these viruses being lymphotrophic might contribute to those lymphomas that older people get. And so we spent a lot of time searching for these using degenerate primers from the monkey viruses. But then two groups, uh, I think one in Germany and one in Italy, discovered these or isolated these viruses from blood. Um, and so the, the, whether they're related to any human disease is still up in the air, mm -hmm. but this is definitely, uh, human polyomavirus 9 is definitely the human variant of the monkey or primate okay. virus. So that's, those are our nine. Yeah. And yeah. is it my understanding that not for, we, we don't have sero surveys for all of them, just for some so far? 
Yeah, we have. Yeah, we haven't got them for all of them, but for ten and eleven we do. Mm -hmm. So ten and eleven are the Malawi and the St. Louis polyomaviruses. Both of those were isolated from stool, mm -hmm. and uh, both of those have a very high seroprevalence in humans. But they look like a, a basic stool polyomavirus, so they're probably human because they're seropositivity. And they're probably replicating in the intestinal tract. Yeah, they're yeah. probably with us all. So in, in one tissue or another, kidney, lung, intestinal tract, maybe respiratory tract, we have some polyomavirus or another replicating in us. We are, walk, we are walking virus factories. For all kinds of viruses. Yeah, not just polyomas, but Yeah, I mean, herpes, I'm questioning, herpes. That, you know, we all know that there's 10 times more bacteria than the genomes than there are, you know, yes. our own genomes. But many people don't realize how many viruses we're actually carrying around. So yeah. I want everyone out there to just stop a minute and think that you have probably two dozen or so viruses in you. Well, I think many more than that. Yes. Anyway. Well, we can't get them too freaked Not out. Not those RNA viruses, though, those pesky little No, the RNA viruses they, come and go, They right? just come and go. They yeah. just, they're not really a problem. Um, and I presume in animals there are lots of polyomaviruses as well? So, yes, and actually one of the big things now, I think, and uh, is that the primate polyomaviruses, mm -hmm. because of all the virus discovery techniques, that a lot of people have been working on discovering primate polyomaviruses. Mm -hmm. And the phylogeny now for these viruses is just becoming rich mm -hmm. because we have primate sequences and human sequences and they seem to track together much more than human to human sequences for example and so our polyomaviruses are much more related to the primate ancestor than they are to some other human polyomaviruses and 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 because there are at least five or ten primate viruses polyomaviruses that haven't been discovered in humans it begs the question whether we will discover those mm -hmm. in humans pretty soon. Right. So I think that that's a really, from an evolutionary point of view, polyomaviruses are turning out to be a very, very interesting group of viruses. Do we know when they entered humans? How long ago? I, 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 would, I wouldn't guess. I wouldn't guess. I would say from the beginning. <laughs> from the beginning. <laughs> or before. Before we're Homo sapiens, it's possible. Right. Possible, yes. Um, it was it probably at one time a zoonosis. We probably acquired them from another animal. But how far back? Yes, I mean there's certainly polyomaviruses in birds and you know yeah. uh, rodents and everything. And so uh, the phylogenetic relationships of those viruses to the primate ones, you know, there's some fiddling to do there. Right. I don't know if you know this, but recently Ian Lipkin published a paper in MBio estimating the total number of viruses in mammals. And he used this, a, a discovery uh, program in bats, in a single species of bat, Teropus giganteus, the flying fox in Bangladesh. And he used PCR for s looking for seven of the nine virus families. And he found four new polyomaviruses in those bats. Really? Yeah. Uh. So I would guess there are many more out there Ma yeah, many to more. be found. I mean, there are many species that haven't even been surveyed for any virus. Absolutely, so. yeah. One of the things I wanted to bring up with, with regard to the phylogeny, though, is, a, is this new paper from Denise Galloway's lab, mm -hmm. which is uh, described in Merkel, this new reading frame called ALTO, uh, Alternative Large T Open Reading Frame. So they discovered this in the Merkel polyomavirus large T, and it's, it's a protein that's made during infection. It doesn't seem to be required for at least mm -hmm. infection. But it looks like middle T. It looks like it may be a middle T. Mm -hmm. And so that, that has led Denise's group to actually start to separate the phylogeny of the polyomas out into those viruses that don't have middle T and have a middle right. T or are developing a middle T and so that's another very interesting evolutionary sort of uh, right. twist on it. Yeah, so these are overlapping reading frames. She calls it overprinting, right? Overprinting. And uh, so you have one open reading frame, and then there's a second shifted, either plus one or minus one or plus two, I guess. And this is, ev in evolutionary terms, always a problem to imagine how this evolved, right? Right. Because there are constraints. If you change one protein, the other, you have to make sure the other doesn't change. And you can't imagine what is the selection for this. And in that paper, they go into that because they can get some clues about how that worked. But it brings up another point about all these new 
polyomaviruses, including Merkel, mm -hmm. we don't have any cells and culture that they'll grow in. So all these new ones, except for uh, BK and JC, you can't grow them? No. Do you know why? Is it... We haven't is found it, the right is thing. Is it a receptor issue or is it post-receptor? A lot of people are working on it and you can't even, it's probably post-receptor because you can't even get it to work with transfected DNA. Yeah. So um, it's a really an issue for studying the biology of a lot of these viruses. And of course, this was, this is very reminiscent of, of you know, the human herpes virus associated with Carposi sarcoma. It took a right. while to find right. the right. cell line that would actually grow this virus. I wanted to ask you what you thought about this idea of using JC as a marker for human migrations. Are you familiar with that story? No, not really. Because no. they apparently the different populations of the world have distinct JC viruses circulating in them. So when a population moves from you know early in human migrations, there were polyomaviruses infecting them and they diversified within the population, say in Africa. And then when people moved out of Africa to Europe, uh, then the, the polyomas diversified differently there. So you can actually tr use this to track. I think that's fascinating. Yeah. And some people think it's useful and others do not. And so a lot of individuals now are looking in different populations. A paper just came out where they looked in a Brazilian Amazon population and found JC viruses different and distinct. Oh, well. So you can... And the idea has been that you can actually track how the populations have migrated over time using serology. And you get slightly different results when you use uh, the gene, the genetic information uh -huh. instead. It's difficult with serology because you really have to find a capsid protein distinctive sure. antigen that will really give you that. It's much, much better to use the genome itself. And of course, this brings up the other, the other issue with these PML patients, the progressive multifocal mm -hmm. leukemia encephalopathy patients, in that you know we're producing this JC virus all the time, but what it looks like in the brain is actually you're selecting variants of VP1 mm -hmm. that may be contributing to the infection and you don't have immunity to it. And so this is still an open story and I think it will evolve in the next few years mm -hmm. whether we're actually selecting for more virulent, sure. virulent uh, you know, escape mutants as you might call them. But with DNA viruses, it's hard because, you know, you, not like the RNA viruses that are so clumsy with the replication. <laughs> yes, we're pretty, we have pretty good proofreading and it's difficult to, to get these guys. Let's, let's just mention again the raccoon polyomavirus. I want to get your take on that. We did that on TWIV. So these are wild trapped raccoons with brain tumors and they isolate polyomaviruses from the brain. And there was something unique about this that wasn't explainable readily. Yeah, I, I'm not so, I don't think all the information is in on that. I mean, I remember Mike Imperiali had some issues with what yeah. was going on. I mean, I think the suggestion was that T antigen was integrated, which is not unprecedented because Merkel does that. Right, 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 so right, 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 right. I haven't heard anything new since then. Have you? No, I no. haven't heard anything. But there's this yeah. other virus, of course, in Australia, which is half polyoma, half papilloma. So mm -hmm. it has the early region of polyoma and the late region of Papilloma right. that infects these marsupials, and uh, and it causes tumors, in, and that's why they picked this, these viruses out. Yeah. And so uh, they're called the bandicoot viruses, and because they grow in bandicoots, this marsupial, but they make very large lesions, uh, you know, in these in the in these marsupials, and they're and they're basically an early and late just complete exchange. And these are recombinants, I presume. These are but they're very stable viruses, they're stable. So you can't, in the lab, make a recombinant between a polyoma and a papilloma, right? Not that we've tried. Yeah. I don't <laughs> know what our biosafety people would say about that. <laughs> so this is one that may have occurred in nature that... Yes, it definitely occurred in nature. Do we have the parents of both halves of the we genome? We don't have the parents, I don't think. Okay. But it's a very interesting recombinant. Hmm, I'm, I'm not aware of that one. We'll have to yeah, there's several that. papers now on the bandicoot. Yeah. Now, you've just published a paper um, recently on polyoma assembly factories in the nucleus. I wanted you to tell us a little bit about that. And we actually have some pictures we can bring up as you get into the story. Sure. So well, this virus has to assemble in the nucleus, as, as we know. But what, what's unusual about this story? Actually, I don't think there's anything unusual about uh -huh. this story. I think, I think virus assembly factories exist for all viruses. Mm -hmm. I think for picornoviruses, of course, 
you know, polio remodels all the cytoplasmic membranes, replicates the symbols on the membranes. It's just, it's an efficiency issue. It's like making automobiles. You want to have an assembly line because you can't have replication going on in one spot and assembly going on in another spot. It's just not efficient. Bunya viruses in the cytoplasm, those have been well described in cryo EMs. Right. Um, so the problem with nuclear virus assembly is that the nucleus is just a structural morass that you just can't see like the cytoplasm. But your herpes and adeno and all of these guys have to have some mm -hmm. kind of factory where they localize, I mean, I'm postulating that they localize replication and assembly at. It's just much more efficient that way. And so the f we took advantage of tissue culture models where you can actually see clumps of virions in the nucleus of an infected cell mm -hmm. and then look close to those clumps to see whether there's structures that might be associated with those clumps of, vir of completed virions that might be actually where mm -hmm. the factories are. And so that was the point of the So here's, whole. let's look at one of these photos from, so let's yeah. put up figure one uh, on the uh, video. There you go. And these, these are the clumps of virions you're talking yeah, yeah. about. Is, is this panel see a crystalline array? Of yeah, them? down here is, you know, this is at the end of infection. You can see why, and we didn't actually finish the story of, you know, whether these viruses are actually lytic and just blow the nucleus right. apart. I mean, there's, there's some papers out there now, some groups that say there's actually a viral protein 4, which is a viral porin. Mm -hmm. that actually pokes holes uh, in, the, in the, the membrane and actually helps these guys get out. But this, obviously this cell is not going to live much longer. Now panel D is some colored version of this, right? Yes. So, so what you can do now with high resolution cryo electron microscopy is, is basically make a three-dimensional tomographic reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And so what you can do here is now look through 60, 100 nanometer sections. Then, so you can do serial sections of the mm -hmm. cell and then composite them together and look in a large volume of how these clumps of viruses and their associated structures relate to each other. And so that's what this is. And this is actually, you know, in the paper turns and is a movie. But right next to these uh, clumps, you can see in, in this panel up here. So put up figure two, please, Chris. There you go, A. Yeah, you can see these long filamentous structures here. Right. And, and those seem to have some, if you look at them at very high resolution, the, the outer coating of these is basically capsid protein coating. And then there's a dark staining interior, which is very reminiscent mm -hmm. of what you might see when you negatively stain a virus that's full. So although it's, it's very, you know, I'd say picturesque, but it's not biochemically mm -hmm. complete, you would say that there's a, a capsid protein coating, viral DNA going down it, and then there's other images that we can see where some of these virions are actually budding off the ends of these tubes. So you call these tubules, right? Those tubules. Are yeah. these made of cellular components? Well, well? They're, you know, that's, that's actually the big question. So the antibodies that we have now are, of course, only to viral proteins, and so what we really like to do is to find out what's associated with these structures. Mm -hmm. And this is where the factory concept, or the factory idea, which I consider an idea for all DNA, all viruses, mm -hmm. comes together with another concept of, that's growing now with DNA viruses that Matt Weissman has put out a number of years ago, that DNA viruses really use the cellular DNA repair machinery to help replicate their viruses. And they may do it in different ways. I mean, adenovirus may devote a whole open reading frame mm -hmm. to knock out non-homologous end joining and something else. But they all utilize cellular DNA repair proteins. And what we find at these sites are cellular DNA repair proteins because right. T binds to things like NBS1 and MRE11, the MRN complex. These are all DNA repair proteins. DNA repair proteins. That, and I think that this is what Ellen Fanning's lab did so well. You know, she actually did a structural analysis of, you know, these replicative intermediates that may have, you know, NICs or mm -hmm. single strands that need to be repaired. Okay. And these okay. proteins really have to be there 
to finish efficiently viral replication. And all of the DNA viruses have these problems in one way or another. And so I think a growing theme is, is that DNA damage proteins are really involved in viral mm -hmm. DNA replication and that they should be at the factories because that's right. where you're making. So the, in this case for SV40, or this is murine polyoma. That's mouse polyoma. Um, the virus is recruiting these to the sites of replication. That's an interesting problem to figure out how that works. Right. Does T antigen interact with, like, say, MRE11? Uh, David Livingston's lab has actually uh, published the only paper I know that SV40 large T binds NBS1, which it's is a different uh, DNA yeah. repair protein. But I mean, the, of course, all these experiments are limited by how good are your antibodies and right. things like that. So again, these DNA repair proteins help repair mistakes that this, the polymerases make during replication or during breaks that occur during replication. Or, or if, like, you're an adenovirus, you don't want to end join every one of your genomes together, <laughs> right, right. otherwise you couldn't package it. So you have to inhibit right. non-homologous, so you, they de dedicate a whole protein to that, mm -hmm. to go knock out that function. So, okay. so there's both a positive and a negative uh, influence on this machine. And of course SV40 doesn't worry because it has circles, so it doesn't have to worry about end joining? It doesn't have to worry, but it has to worry about you know, nicks and, and, right. and, and you has know, to fix them. other things. Do any, do any viruses encode their own DNA repair proteins? That's a good question, and you know, I, since I specialize in the small ones, yes, I would uh, guess the answer I would be yes. I would guess that the I answer think the, is yes. I think the Mimis might. You know, they have so well, many. Well, those genes. are so big, huge. That one thousand two hundred genes. Or yeah, something. but now there's Pandora, right? There is Pandora, which is which is two thousand five hundred. So there has to be DNA repair proteins yeah, yeah. in there. So these tubules um, are what you think are sites of DNA replication and virus assembly, right? So potentially. Okay. Okay. But whether, whether or not the factories come as tubes or as some other structure that we haven't identified yet, we're pretty confident that next to virus clusters, there has to be some kind of factory. Right. And when you look in a cell with, for example, fluorescent and situ hybridization for viral DNA, you see distinct foci of where the virus DNA is. So those are the little factories. Okay. Could you put back up back figure two, Chris, because I want you to tell us what panel C is with this beautiful purple and yellow. <laughs> this is one of the tomographic reconstructions. Yeah, so that's a, that's a, a single slice. That's a single slice of a, a frozen, uh, uh, quick frozen embedded tomographic slice of a nuclear virus factory. And, and uh, the, the uh, the EM people have color coded in purple the completed viruses, mm -hmm. and then in yellow the tubes that have some stain in them, and then red empty tubes. So there's a mat of completed viruses. Yeah. The tubes are underneath. The Is tubes are right next to the, and actually what this other, this other uh, section shows from a previous is that all of these factories are sort of interconnected together in the nucleus in three dimensions. This is just a slice, but you can see these tubes going oh, between see. them. Right. And so there's sort of like little satellite stations making these. So are the, I'm not sure how this, are the virions assembling in the tubes or on the surface of the tubes? Oh, we, we have don't no know. clue. Oh, that's what we really like to know. Is this gonna keep you busy for the rest of your career? It depends on the NIH, of course. You know. <laughs> It, this kind of stuff used to be what everyone did, right? And nowadays it's getting harder to do. This is basic science, basic research, understanding the nuts and bolts, and that's where the big discoveries come from. You can't predict it, but... Right, and, and we think that this is applicable to all kinds of DNA viruses, because when we stain these, you know, dots for, you know, the DNA repair proteins, we mm -hmm. get immunofluid. So now you've got to go to higher resolution and actually see using very elaborate techniques. For example, Ann Arvin, I, you, Ann Arvin, I know, Ann, sure. Ann and VSV, they have cryo-EM images. VZV, VZV. VZV, sorry, VZV, images in the nucleus of assembly of VZV right. that are just stunning. And I think the technology of imaging, uh, Clota O'Shea with, with, mm -hmm. with, with the adenovirus E4 or uh, protein, stunning images in the nucleus of these sort of factories and virions. I think as we press the imaging technology, we're gonna learn more about virus assembly and 
and in consequence a lot more about cell biology because these nuclear dots are where DNA repair occurs, mm -hmm. you know, in normal DNA damage by other means. And so if we can figure out the structures and the proteins that come to these, we're going to learn a lot more about normal cell biology. Of course, as viruses always lead normal cell of biology. Of course, of course. So did we do a good big picture of polyomaviruses? I Is think there we, anything? I, 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 you no, know, I, I think we did a very Is this an episode you would assign your students? Yeah. <laughs> I would. <laughs> I'm going to assign my students. You want to ask a question? Absolutely. So I... What's your I, name? I'm, well, my name's Robbie Allen, and I work at Sega Technologies, which is an antiviral discovery company. And development company as well, we have compounds against orthopox viruses and things like that. But going back to JC virus, what can we learn, if anything, from SIV-infected monkeys about specifically JC virus and PML-like disease, if there is a JC-like virus in that setting? But also, just in general, polyomavirus pathologies in the context of SIV infection. So that's fairly well known, actually, some of this. Not how you treat it, but what causes it. SV40 causes PML in SIV-infected monkeys. So they don't have JC virus, but they have SV40. Mm -hmm. wow. And SV40 is the lesion in these monkeys that causes PML. Uh, that's the causative agent. And so for SIV and HIV, it's pretty clear and a little, it's pretty simple that it's just immunosuppression. And it allows these viruses to replicate outside of the proximal renal tubule to, you know, systemically spread. And then you can't, and so they end up infecting other cells that mm -hmm. have receptors that are appropriate. So are we talking about evolution of a neuroinvasive, a more neuroinvasive strain within the individual, or do you see sort of infection of those same cells during the regular course of infection outside of the absence of, say, uh, immune pressure or anything like that? You don't see it because, you know, the, the because we have a very good immune, because you know, we have a very good immune system and that's why we're sort of, you know, cohabitating with all of these viruses. And, and it's very, very rare to get a CNS infection with any of these polyomaviruses, de novo. In fact, for most of the polyomaviruses, the first clinical manifestations are entirely unknown. I mean, we get BK when we're, you know, before we're five, but what was it? Some diarrhea that we had or something like we don't know. JC or, or Wookiee or whatever, we don't know. Um, so even the primary manifestations are still opaque, but it's very, it's very, very unusual unless you're immunosuppressed that these viruses actually cause a disease that's detrimental to the host. And, and, uh, but SV40 is a good example of how you might, in an SIV monkey, you know, you might design therapies where you could, you know, try to work on you know, how to stop this, but that's a tough model system, too. That's a tough model mm -hmm. system. And we, as we were discussing, the targets here <clears throat> are uh, really hard. They're really hard. They're not like thymidine kinase. You know, they're really hard targets. I think a lot of antiviral targets are really hard. I mean, some of the, you know, the hep C targets are really oh, good. And enzyme is always easier, en right? Enzyme's are very easy. But T antigen, I would think. Yeah, because these viruses are so small and they recruit all these other proteins from the cell, you know, they, they, they sort of don't have, a, those are the targets that you want to hit, but yeah. you can't hit protein phosphatase 2A because it's a normal cellular protein, right? right. So, um, yeah, it's a very difficult problem, but a very important one. That's why I would go for more of the capsid protein approach and inhibiting assembly because those are really viral proteins. Well, if, you, if you're interested in pursuing this, you guys should talk afterwards. <laughs> as I said, he's a former product of my department at Columbia and is now, now discovering vir antivirals. So. Yeah, I, well, didn't, I didn't tell him to come here. Oh, you didn't? No, no plants here. Uh, I'm going to read a few emails. Oh, sure. And while I'm doing this, if you want to make a pick, you can think of something. You don't have to. I won't put any pressure okay. on you. But it would be fun. Uh, the first one is from Christophe, who writes, funny how you can feel like you know people you have never met, although perhaps not so strange after listening to them speak for literally hundreds of hours. 
Vincent likes to explore the demographic of his audience, so here is a quick bio. 44 years old, born and raised in Australia, now living in Canada for 10 years. No science training, but I've always been interested in science, technology, history, art, and philosophy. I am a web designer and I work in Toronto. I first discovered TWIP while searching iTunes for a science podcast, then through that TWIV and TWIM. I started at episode one and have now, after many, many months, caught up with all three. Some of the discussions are too technical for me, but I would rather listen to experts discuss something I occasionally don't understand than have you guys dumb it down. I like that. The banter is welcome, even the occasional heavy breathing by Dixon. Feel free to lose <laughs> yourself. Feel free to lose yourself in digressions on lawnmowers, boats, and weather patterns whenever you like. The unforced friendly camaraderie is half the appeal, I think. Now, onto what we made made me right now. Apart from finally getting up to date, I thought I would share a recent small WTF moment. I've always thought homeopathy was ridiculous and am constantly trying to gently convince some of my otherwise intelligent friends and family just why it makes no logical sense. Even without looking at clinical trials, it fails basic plausibility. With little result, I am just branded the cynic, skeptic, closed-minded curmudgeon. A lot of my friends are anti-establishment types and while intelligent, they tend to conspiracy and woo. Anyway, I thought I would share this facepalm moment. I got into discussion on Facebook about vaccination. After a bit of back and forth, the original post was anti-vax, then I countered, etc. I stopped trying when a third person posted this. Quote, I've left this decision, vaccination, to my children so they can make their own informed choice. End quote. Right. So once they are 18, they can choose to get vaccinated for a childhood disease. Sigh. P.S. I just finished reading Dan Brown's latest book, Inferno. Unfortunately, not a great book. I had enjoyed the earlier ones, but this one seemed phoned in and formulaic. Without getting into detail, that might be considered a spoiler. What makes it relevant here is around chapter 100, one of the characters mentions Fouché's H5N1 ferret apocalypse. <laughs> That's oh an anti-pick, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, this letter started more than a month ago. We'd just like to give a listener pick, a weekly podcast by Dr. Carl Kuznelnicki. Dr. Carl has degrees in physics and math, biomedical engineering, medicine and surgery, and has worked as a physicist, tutor, filmmaker, car mechanic, laborer, and as a medical doctor at the Kids Hospital in Sydney. He co-hosts a weekly call-in show on Australian radio and answers listeners' questions about pretty much anything and everything with good humor and is always promoting the scientific method. He occasionally gets things wrong but is cheerfully upfront when called on it and corrects himself, just like we are here on TWIP. We always are cheerfully corrected. So he gives us a link for that. Sorry for the rambling email and thanks for the great podcast. P.P.S. I have taken so long to write this that the temperature has gone from 2 degrees centigrade and overcast to 30 degrees centigrade and sunny. <laughs> Sounds like multiple seasons. Regards, Christophe. Uh, the next one is from Tom. Let's see, is this the one I wrote? Yes, this is a good one. Uh, hello again to the TWIV hood. The TWIV 242 letters section inspired some excellent comments from Alan about science journalism and the challenge of finding a way to make it pay. One of my net savvy relatives is a fan of Zynga games on Facebook. These games generally include two types of in-game money for purchasing in-game items. One type is earned by playing the game, and the other type is purchased online with real world money. This has a tendency to create two classes within the game, the rich players and everybody else. Since the best features and items are often only accessible with the purchased in-game money, this can be a disincentive to playing the game. Zynga has recently come up with what I consider a brilliant solution to this problem. Players can earn money money by choosing to open short in-game advertising videos. This is a win-win for everybody. The advertiser gets your eyes and pays Zynga. Zynga gets income to stay in business and players get access to all the game features. Alan, you said that everybody wants free content and hates ads. Imagine one of those publication sites behind paywalls offering non-subscribing visitors access to a given paper if they first agree to watch an advertisement. An ad for TWIV, that would be great, right? There's an interesting psychological switch getting flipped here. If I click a link and see an ad pop up in my face before I get where I want to go, I hate it. 
if the site first politely asks me to help earn them income by watching the same ad, and then they'll show me the content, I feel altruistic and don't mind at all. I'm contributing without having to pay any money. Maybe something like this will catch on in support of online journalism. Heck, Vincent could easily put an ad on the TWIV site with a click here to earn money for TWIV label, and folks wouldn't mind helping cover TWIV production costs. Side note, I suspect there are any number of ongoing studies of psychological addiction focusing on Zynga games. They're not only conceptual viruses, they're constantly evolving to become even more addictive. That's from Tom, who's in Austin, Texas, and he writes, P.S. When you find out if and when and where you're going to be doing a TWIV in Austin this October, please post it somewhere on the TWIV site. I'd like to attend, if at all possible. And we are going to be there between October 15th and 17th, uh, Tom, and we will let you know the exact date on the TWIV website. I thought you were already making a whole bunch of money on those coffee mugs. Oh, uh, we, we don't make any money on the mugs. Oh, you know? They just... Disappears. Yeah, I don't, I don't make money on them. I just want people to buy TWIV coffee mugs and put them on the table, and people will look at them and say, what's that? And then I'll get another fan, oh. right? That's why I have a, uh, did you see my TWIV iPhone case? Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that nice? It's beautiful. Everybody knows this, but uh, you can get one of these. Go on TWIV.tv and find out. We don't make any money off of these either. Uh, two more. Next one's from Adam. Hello, I'm a relatively new TWIV fan, but I'm definitely hooked now. 547.47 degrees R, 304.15 degrees K, 31 degrees Celsius, 88 degrees Fahrenheit, with partly cloudy skies here in southern Michigan. I thought he was giving his coordinates for a minute. Oh, really? In TWIV 241, you discussed the potential use of stalk-specific antibody delivery via adeno-associated virus vectors in the development of an influenza vaccine. As you mentioned, this is a permanent change, the long-term effects of which are not known to any appreciable extent. Of course, stalk-specific vaccines are a major area of research. In a recent letter published in Nature, the group described a nanoparticle-based approach that seems to have quite a bit of promise with regards to the induction of broad-based immunity. I've attached a link to the article. And I'm including a link to a Facebook page I found called Virology Fact of the Day that posts fairly interesting stuff on a high school bio to undergrad level. Not sure if this counts as a listener pick. Absolutely, why not? And um, so we'll put a link to that in the show notes. We talked about this flu nanoparticle-based based vaccine last time, Adam. It's a really interesting concept. They use ferritin, which forms these nanoparticles on its own. They link the HA of flu to it. They get a highly immunogenic particle which apparently gives cross-protective hmm. uh, immunity to at least the H1 strains that they tried. So thanks for that, Adam. And uh, our next one is from Bruna. Hey there, I'm a young virologist from Brazil. I'm finishing my master's degree at the University of Brasilia. I'm looking for a PhD opportunity in the US. I already have funding from Science Without Borders. What, is I, what I need is someone who will accept me. I would like to know if you guys have some clues about any group working on infectious clones, plant expression systems, plant biotechnology, interactions between plants and viruses. It could be really extensive, I know. So I, I'll tell you what I'm doing in my masters. Maybe it would help. I've constructed an infectious clone of a Tobamo virus, and now I've modified it to display peptides. I hope you can help me. So we have lots of plant virologists listening, Bruna, so hopefully they will email me and we'll put you in touch with Bruna. So that you could view this as a job ad on TWIV, which yeah. is not bad, That's right? That's good, yeah. Any plant virologists here in Denver? Not that I know of, no, right? No, not really. I know there's some in Nebraska. There's lots of corn all over the place. So uh, check it out. Let's see, should I read any more? Mm, one more. This is from uh, Deborah, writing from Scotland here, where we have actually had some warm, at least for us, weather at 19 degrees Celsius and sunshine. Not typical of the upcoming season, but taking advantage nonetheless. I recently graduated with honors in virology from Glasgow University, where I started listening to TWIV in my third year. Vincent only found out afterwards you were at the Center for Virus Research hosting an episode. Wished I could have snuck in. It was refreshing to listen to discussion debates about viruses as well as associated topics with other guests when taking a break from journals and textbooks. Unfortunately, I've not been keeping up with listening since leaving university a couple of months ago, but intend to catch up 
and keep reading related material before pursuing postgrad study next year. Which brings me to my main question. I'm currently reading a TWIV pick, Ignorance, How It Drives Science, and would really like a good book covering the history of microbial diseases and pandemic events, not just influenza. I have come across one or two, but find they are more written for the layperson and wondered if you could recommend any more detailed works. Hope you can suggest a good pick and keep twiving. So I went through the Twiv bookstore. By the way, Deborah, we do have a Twiv bookstore. You can check out the link to it at twiv.tv. Uh, unfortunately, most of the books are really aimed at lay people. I found um, maybe two that might be interesting to you. The Coming Plague by Laurie Garrett. Did you read that? Mm -hmm. I think it's more above lay person level. And Viruses, Plagues, and History by Michael Oldstone. You know that one? I do. But they may be both two. two. Do you know any more? technical book that addresses that? I don't know of any. Not technical, no. Not a layperson level, more, yeah. more science level. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we'll put it out to the TWIV audience and um, see how they do with it. All right, that's it for our email for today. We have plenty more, but we'll save that for another time. Did you come up with a pick? No? Well, my pick is an old pick. That's fine. My pick is The Panic Virus. That's a great book. It's a great book. I give it to the kids in my class every year, uh, and it's becoming increasingly more important. Do you know we had Seth Mnookin on a TWIV? Yeah. Yeah. I give them actually the TWIV when they get the book. That's and, great. And, and, and uh, you know, there was just an outbreak, you know, of pertussis in Texas, you know. We actually heard about a, uh, we had a pertussis talk earlier here right in this room. It's increasing in, in the elderly. Yeah. The vaccine doesn't seem to be lasting. The protection is yeah. Well, when they went over from the you know the acellular yeah. version, and, and but uh, I think that that's a great book, and it's a great book on many many levels. Yes. Well, we don't mind repeating picks because, as Andre Gide once said, it doesn't matter if you repeat yourself because no one listens anyway. <laughs> All right. My pick is a fun site. It is. Uh, a behind-the-scenes look at the chest burster from Alien. Remember that? When the thing yeah, burst yeah. out? So the guy made a model, actually. He made a plastic model that moves, and he talks about how he built this. And That's what's actually coming out of the chest. It's actually a model that there's a, there's a puppeteer moving it underneath. So no CGI back then, I guess. Oh, wow. So this is a cool little video of how they did it and some bloody pictures of clips from the movie. but thought this was really cool. So the chest <laughs> burster behind the scenes with film director and special effects designer Stephen Norrington. And we had a couple of listener picks. You heard them. And that will do it for TWIV number 250. It's pretty cool you got in on a nice number, right? That's very nice. 250. Thank you. Um, you, you know, we're going to come up on 300 soon. I don't know what we're going to do for that. Because 200, we visited the BSL-4. We should have a big party. A big party. Maybe... A 24-hour TWIV. <laughs> you can find this episode of TWIV at TWIV.tv, at iTunes, and at microworld.org slash TWIV. If you want to help us, go on over to iTunes and rate the show or leave a comment. That really helps us to stay visible in the iTunes directory. And we do love to get your questions and comments. Send them to TWIV at TWIV.tv. Bob Garcia, my guest today, is at the University of Colorado Boulder. I really appreciate you coming out today to do this. Thank you so much. Thanks, Vincent. It's good to talk to you. After. I haven't seen you in many, many years. And yeah. Glad to see the work's going great. Good. That's really good. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for supporting us coming here to, to do TWIV at ICAC. And I'd like to thank the guys who are running the equipment today, Warren over there on one camera, Ray Ortega on another camera, our producer Chris and Diane, thank you, and our sound guy Steve, thanks a lot. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> Once you're in the BSL-4 space, the only way you can get out is to go through a chemical shock. It's an unusual room, never seen anything like this.
Anybody who has access to this facility first has to go through an R scan. So the HEPA filters filter the air coming out of the facility and that will remove bacteria, viruses, anything that might constitute any kind of risk, right? Remember this building is, is basically a second building inside the main building.